everyone. Welcome to our um, online puppet forum uh, about Feel Your Best Self. Um, my name is Emily Wicks, and I'm the interim co-director at the Ballard Institute. And I am assisted tonight by my co-director, Matt Sorensen. Normally you will see John Bell leading these forums, but he is on a much deserved sabbatical. So I am here filling in tonight. So I'm very excited to welcome you to um, this forum all about a project that has become very near and dear to my heart. So um, just a reminder that all of this free programming, these three, these forums and all of our other free programming are really um, are possible because of support um, from our friends here at the Ballard Institute. So if you're interested in making a donation, uh, Matt will be dropping a link in both the Zoom and Facebook chat. Just to give you a heads up on some events that are coming up next weekend, we will have uh, Squirrel Stole My Underpants at the Ballard Institute Theater. It's really the first show that we have back in person uh, in our theater, and we're very excited to welcome back Bonnie Duncan of the Gotta Bees. This is an absolutely adorable show, um, so I encourage you to get tickets for Saturday the 19th at 11 a.m., and you can purchase those on our Ticket Leap website that Matt will drop in the chat. After uh, Bonnie Duncan's show, we will have another one, uh, Sleeping Beauty by Tanglewood Marionettes on December 3rd at 11 a.m. And that will be part of Winter Welcome, which will be a larger event in downtown stores. We have uh, one more forum after this on December 6th at 7 p.m. online. We will welcome Claudia Orenstein, uh, a professor at Hunter College, who will lead a forum on topics in Japanese puppetry. So to learn about these upcoming events, you can join our email list and Matt will uh, share that link with you as well. Now this whole forum is all about um, our collaborative project called Feel Your Best Self. So if you're interested in checking out the Feel Your Best Self tool toolkit as we talk, feel free to uh, go to the website feelyourbestself.org and you can kind of look at it while we're chatting about it. There's also a way on the Feel Your Best Self website to join um, the mailing list so that you get newsletters and updates because the toolkit is still evolving and still growing. So Matt will drop all of that information in the chat as we get going. So tonight we have a really exciting panel of uh, speakers. I'm excited to have them all back because we worked so closely on developing this Feel Your Best uh, Self project. So I wanna welcome to the Zoom and Facebook Live stage, uh, Dr. Sandy Chifulius, Dr. Emily Iovino, Yanni Frank, and Sarah Nolan. So just to, oh, Sarah, I think we're getting some, there we go. <laughs> just to um, do some quick introductions. Um, Sandy, or Dr. Uh, Chifulius, is a distinguished professor in the NEAG School of Education who teaches in the school psychology program. She is also the founder and co-director of the Yukon Collaboratory on School and Child Health and is the co-creator of Feel Your Best Self. Dr. Emily Iovino serves as associate director, educational psychology coordinator, and implementation support for Feel Your Best Self. And she is a postdoctoral research associate, associate working with Sandy. She is also a licensed psychologist in the state of Connecticut and a nationally certified school psychologist. Now, Yaniv Frank uh, served many roles with the Feel Your Best Self uh, videos. So I'm not going to list them all, Yaniv. People can look at the credits, but you really helped with developing the original characters and stories and the scripts. Uh, he is a Sesame, Street, uh, Sesame Workshop trained puppeteer and a current member of the cast of Sesame Street, the musical playing off Broadway. So get your tickets to check Yaniv out live. He is a current third year puppet arts MFA candidate at, at UConn. So he'll be finishing up this spring. And as an actor, Yaniv has performed in various educational and professional theaters and received Hunter College's Theater Workshop Award for the most promising student actor. So uh, welcome Yaniv, it's really good to see you again. And there we go, Whew, perfect timing, Sarah Nolan. As ever, Sarah served, also served many roles on this project, um, including director and art director for Feel Your Best Self, the, the videos. Um, she is a puppeteer and filmmaker uh, and resides in uh, Massachusetts where she works as a freelance puppeteer, director, and puppet builder. She's also um, a, a resident artist at Puppet Show Place in Brookline, Massachusetts and tours her own shows. And Sarah Nolan is alumni, alumna of the Yukon Puppet Arts Program and has worked closely with us on so many projects. So it's, it's always a joy. Sarah, I always love to share that you were my first graduate assistant at the Ballard Institute. So it's like welcoming you home to the Ballard Institute forum stage. <laughs> I was there when the walls went up. <laughs> exactly. So welcome to all the speakers. 
So um, I, we want to get started, I think, with a little bit of what is Feel Your Best Self, because some people that are watching might not even know what this project is or how it came about. So let's start there. And then we're going to really kind of dive into how did these stories and scripts get created. Now, as we're going on both Facebook Live and Zoom, Matt is monitoring both as we go. And if you have questions, feel free to drop those in the Zoom chat or the Facebook chat, and we will make sure to save time at the end for that conversation. Sandy, do you want to pull up your uh, PowerPoint? Sure. So I get the, the professor job, right, of doing your a basic PowerPoint. Just kidding. Um, no, it, I get the actually fun part of sharing where we are now at the end of Feel Your Best Self. So I think that Emily's going to walk us, and that's the point of coming today, is to see what happens to make it to a, a final-ish product, because there's a lot of steps to that, as, we, well, as the rest of you know. But um, I get the fun part of starting on the end. So let me just start the show. So well, there, there, are, there are our puppets, right? This is where we're gonna see. But I think it's important to start with why did we create this? Because yes, it's fun and yes, it's cool and yes, it's exciting, but there's actually a really important message behind what's going on in there. Um, so as a psychologist, Emily Iovino and I you know, had worked a lot uh, as schools were shutting down and as the pandemic was happening to figure out how do you support emotional well-being as schools reopen? We had a serious problem with child mental health before the pandemic happened, but it's kind of like that Band-Aid was ripped off and huge gashes started just flowing out as, as, as the world figured out what we were doing. And we were getting really worried as schools were beginning to reopen or think about reopening, about all of the efforts were focused on physical mitigation for good reason, because we didn't really know what we were all doing, but we knew the emotional toll was going to be there as well. And we knew that systems were already really stressed. I was stressed, I don't know about you, but I was stressed about that. You know, teachers were stressed. So to think that we were gonna be able to do something like that was a huge complicated system of overhauling trauma-informed supports and servicing really intensive needs was really a, a kind of a big concern. So, you know, I, I do wanna emphasize that the problem was there before for the pandemic. It's not something that came up of. We have a serious uh, child and adolescent mental health crisis, so much so that about a year ago, all the powerhouse organizations in, in kind of child health got together and declared a, a national emergency. And so those of you that aren't in my psychology world might not really know what that means. So I like to pull just a couple of pictures and, and a couple of stats to kind of put that in context for you. So we already talked about COVID and, and kind of the things that happen in COVID, but maybe you don't realize how many kids have, are grieving and have losses right now as a result of losing a parent caregiver. It's about an average of one in 360. If you get down to other regions like the New York area, you're talking about more like one in 200. It's a lot of grief and loss. We know that in Connecticut and nationwide, we're really worried about child suicide attempts. And it was a really interesting study I was reading on, on uh, uh, suspected attempts or calls to the National Poison Control. And these data were from 2015 to 2020. So this is even before pandemic. And what was most astounding to me was that there was over a 100% increase in suspected attempts for 10 to 12 year olds, 10 to 12 year olds. We know that that's coming into schools. Uh, U.S. Department of Education collects these like dashboards of, of what's happening in schools. And we, we hear that uh, as of May, this past May, uh, over 80% of schools are reporting increases in the needs of uh, children seeking school mental health services. We know that over 70, 80% of schools are reporting they need help, they need more mental health services, they need, teachers need strategies to help um, deal with it. We need professional learning um, and all those great things. And then back uh, about six months ago, uh, U.S. Prevention Task Force um, made a recommendation that all children eight years and older be screened for anxiety. And for most of you attending today, you're also included in that group because just a few months ago, the task force recommended that adults under age 65 also be screened for anxiety. So we do have a problem and it's pretty serious. And a single solution isn't going to solve it. So going out and training lots more of the Emily's and I as school psychologists is not going to solve the problem. We need to look at it from a prevention standpoint. What are the skills 
What are the emotion focused coping skills that each of us needs to be able to help us navigate through challenging situations? And we need to teach it early in a promotion and prevention standpoint. And so that was a long way of talking about how we got to feel your best self. And I think we're going to get more into this in a little bit, but I thank goodness for my, my co-creator, Emily Wicks, for reaching out one day as um, Emily and I were talking and writing things and doing podcasts about these topics I just talked about with you and reached out one day. I think she calculated it was almost two years ago now um, and said, hey, you know, we work with schools too. Uh, we do workshops. Um, can we figure out how to partner together in bringing our, uh, joining our expertise? And that was really the birth of I'll Feel Your Best Self. And I'm not going to get into a lot more of that now. I just want to run through a couple of quick slides just to share with you what the final product is right now or the final that's always evolving product. And then we're going to go back to how did we get here? So Feel Your Best Self is really targeting elementary age kids. We have strategies that help them, emotion-focused coping strategies to help you calm yourself, catch your feelings, and connect with others. The idea of a toolkit is to be really fun and a way to complement the things that teachers are already doing in their classrooms and strengthen family collaboration because all the materials you, you're going to see today or we'll talk about are free. You can watch them at home. You can watch them wherever you want. And the idea behind it, the theory behind emotion-focused coping skills is that we need to regularly practice really simple things that can contribute to how we feel right now, right here in this moment. So if we're not really feeling our best self, what's a strategy I could use to bring more, more, um, more valence is the word that we use in, into, that, into that day. And if we do that on a regular basis and we make it part of our regular routines, we can be lifted and meaning fill your best self. And that contributes to how you evaluate your overall life, your meaning, your purpose, your satisfaction, all those great things. So the idea behind fill your best self was to figure out really simple things, really simple strategies that help us build our emotion focused coping skills um, and find a couple. So we have 12 really wonderful things to show you, but it wouldn't be expected that you would use all of them. You got to try them out, test drive them and figure out which ones work for you. And this is what those strategies are and, and we're translated into. So Emily Iovino and I took all the stuff that we know, not all the stuff, but a lot of the stuff we know were things that we would be doing in schools or in our more intensive practices, try to figure out which ones we'd have to cross off the list because they were just too complicated to learn really easily and figure out which ones could we rename, make them really fun and, and teach them very simply. So that's where we are. And we have our three friends, which I think, I guess I'm gonna introduce them, right? Cause I'm not sure we're, we're, that we'll actually name them or meet them later, but we have three friends that were created to help teach these strategies to each other. So this is Mina, this is CJ, and this is Nico. So cute, right? And so we're gonna go back and we're gonna go back today and really focus on the development to get us to the video pieces, but I just wanted to make folks aware that there are actually, there are actually five components to the full Feel Your Best Self toolkit, um, which you can see here. The first part are these videos, which are all, we're gonna take a look at some of them in a little bit, so we won't harp on those for uh, too long. But we also have a very, a very simple one-page tip sheet. So if you are gonna watch this at home, maybe you wanna pull up the tip sheet and have some really guided questions and some ideas of how you practice it, how you watch it, talk about it, and then practice it. And then we've got these strategy cards. So you can take those, that simple strategy, like shake out the yuck and have a three-step sequence to show you how do you shake out the yuck. And we have them in Spanish. Um, almost everything will be up in Spanish within the next couple of weeks. We've got reflection sheets. sheets. So if you're in a classroom or in a private practice and you want to kind of have journaling or reflection going on, you can do that. We've got a guide to help you facilitate it. If you don't, if you need some ideas of how to use these materials, um, Emily Iobino did a wonderful job scripting out. If, if I'm in a classroom and I wanna introduce one strategy in a month, what would that look like? All kinds of different guides. And then Emily Wicks uh, and Matt and lots of other people on the team really worked to build a, if you want to incorporate puppet making into using this uh, toolkit so that kids have their own friend to practice with, here, um, we have a guide for how you can 
build your materials from everything from using stuff you already have to a more fancy sock puppet like what you see here that we did with some of our friends in a first grade class in Wyndham just two weeks ago. Um, so example materials of what you would buy and how you do it. And if you wanted the sock pup to do the sock puppet, that's how you might build it. And I'm gonna end on just sharing with you some of the ways that we have been trying this out since, since really, I guess the summertime, right? Uh, or last year um, in preschools, in summer camps, um, in elementary classrooms, full class classrooms where kids are using their journals and reflecting and filling out all their fun stuff and talking about all the great things that are out there. And I think Emily, I hope you know, might be sharing a little bit more of that um, as we go further along. So I'm gonna turn it back to Emily Wicks. That's um, amazing. And I think just on this last slide, you see that we're on most of the social medias. So make sure to follow Feel Your Best Self on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, hopefully soon TikTok. Um, so check us out and follow us along just to get those updates. Uh, so that that was a really wonderful like summary of what this project has evolved into and how much it's grown and how just... I'm continually impressed by like what it has become, but that, you know, it kind of, I think it's important for us to maybe go back to the beginnings before Feel Your Best Self even had a name. So I'm kind of curious, Emily and Sandy, if we can maybe start there. Um, Emily, uh, what, how are the, how are these strategies that we now call Feel Your Best Self, how were they being used before we really came up with this idea to bring together these strategies with puppetry? That's a really great question. So Sandy talked about the need for simple strategies and kind of how we looked at things that we would be doing in practice as school psychologists or school-based mental health professionals. Um, and, you know, the, the quick story is that they're all grounded in something called cognitive behavioral therapy. So that's kind of the overarching framework of something that we know works really well to help with changing our thoughts, feelings, and behavior. So using CBT-based strategies, there's you know really complex ways to do that. And some that require, as Sandy mentioned, a certain, you know, things that not everybody can do. You need a certain level of training to be able to dive into certain things. Um, but these strategies here, although not necessarily, we wouldn't call them before feel your best self by these fun names, except maybe belly breathing. I think that's the only one that others might have, you know, heard of and be using in other spaces. But I think the key is when we were thinking about, okay, how do we take these strategies that we know work and group them into kind of skills that we would target? How do we, how do we do that? So we have, we kind of landed on these three categories of skills. So we have calm yourself, which are our strategies that teach sort of those self-soothing skills when, you know, you're feeling really big feelings in the moment, how we can kind of bring it back down. And then we have catch your feelings, which promote self-awareness. So being able to stop and kind of recognize what we might be feeling in a given moment and do something to make that better or different. And then connecting with others, which really focus on the importance of social relationships. Um, and within that, things like acts of kindness, which is a strategy that we know makes both the person who's receiving kindness feel better and the person who is engaging in the act of kindness feel better. And gratitude, which is another one that, you know, really evidence informed strategy to help, you know, both someone that maybe you're expressing gratitude towards and yourself feel better. If we, you know, a simple practice that we might've done beforehand would be, let's think at, you know, at the end of every day, a, a sort of homework assignment, if you will, we might give a kid is to think of three things at the end of each day that we're grateful for, to be able to, you know, change sort of our affect or feeling about that day and make us feel a little bit lighter and better. Within the calm yourself, you know, some of the fun names and things that we might've, might have done is things like progressive muscle relaxation. If any listeners have heard of that, that's what ground it down is really kind of related to. And, you know, shake out the yuck is that physical. We're letting go of that, you know, those feelings. We're using some brief physical activity. And chillax in my head is, you know, kind of like a guided imagery if anyone's heard of that that's listening. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of a, I think a little bit about how some of these were used before. So often these are a lot of things too. If you walk into classrooms, even before COVID, you know, you'd often see a teacher saying, all right, you know, 
let's stop. We got to take a big, you know, deep breath together as a class. So it's just kind of packaging it in a fun way of now we're doing belly breathing and we have the characters to kind of bring that together and model that. So how are you presenting or using these strategies, um, you know, before, before Fill Your Best Self came up, came about, I remember you introduced me uh, to a report and that was really the first time I was reading about them, but kind of what, you know, what had you been doing with them so far? So what we were really doing was trying to take what we call kernels of behavioral influence. So these are little tiny tidbits of those kind of effective evidence informed strategies that anyone can use. So it's not just someone that has training in, in you know, mental health. Anybody can, can do physical activity or take a belly breath or, you know, think about something and try to, you know, focus on a thought and, and shift and see the world or see what you're thinking about maybe through a different lens. So those are the types of things that, you know, right before Feel Your Best Self, we were really focused on getting those simple strategies into the hands of educators, families, and community members to say, these are things that we know work to help us feel a little lighter when things are, you know, feeling really heavy right now. Um, but that anyone can do. And it's not, you know, we don't need training to do these things to feel better. So that's kind of how we were using it before, you know, kind of before and as this collaboration was starting was really trying to work on giving people the ability to just really quickly and easily do things that can improve emotional well-being and that feeling in the moment, like Sandy talked about before. That's, so that's really interesting. And, and I think kind of what I loved witnessing was kind of when we did c combine the Ballard Institute and CSCH to kind of create what became Feel Your Best Self, we started to have these conversations of how to make these strategies engaging and fun for kids. And so Yaniv will kind of start to bring you into the conversation because, you know, you mentioned that these strategies are things that a lot of us might already know or, or use, but how do we make make them into stories that are something that children will engage with and actually be able to connect with. So I'm kind of curious, you know, I think the next step was, I don't know if you need, knew what he was getting on board with that summer, but we kind of, we came together and, and started to, to map out these strategies and think about stories. And so um, I know Emily and Yaniv, you spent a lot of time kind of navigating how to balance the storytelling with the educational resource research behind these strategies. Can you both talk a little bit about that kind of, I guess, balancing act that you had to play? Yeah, um, I, I think that um, it, it definitely is exactly that. It's, it's quite the balancing act because, you know, when we're, we're trying to package these lessons in the form of stories with these uh, specific characters, um, we have to balance the relatability and the specificity and the, the content and the curriculum with the entertainment piece of it. Um, so it, it was a lot of the, the conversations that we had were about like, how, how can we make sure that, that these characters are going to be teaching something, but also acting like kids themselves. And how can we make sure that these characters are relatable to anyone who's watching, but also have specific uh, given circumstances in their lives and balancing the, the curriculum with the art side of it was a lot of the work that we did in creating those uh, initial stories. If I can, I jump in for one second too. Then, so I think we had one really cool example was uh, grounded down. So Emily talked about this idea of like this progressive muscle relaxation, and Yaniv, I don't know if you remember, but like our original idea was something called take your legs to space. That's what Emily and I come up with, right? But we tried to think about well, how does that go into a story that you can use puppets and that kids could like use in regular classroom? Because you can ground it down and do progressive muscle relaxation in your seat, in your, in, in school, but you can't really like drop to the floor and stick your legs up in the air. So like, like that's part of the evolution. If you remember. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. And I remember having a lot of conversations where, you know, like you and I would be on zoom and I'd be like, okay, here are some resources I have on how I would give this strategy. I, but I don't know how to make it fun. Help, help us make it fun. Right. And so, you know, how, 
and then to Sandy's point, it's that how can we also engage puppets and make sure these are strategies that we can have a puppet illustrating as well and showing and modeling that. Muted. Oh, Yaniv, when you were presented with these strategies and in, in the research material, how did you take these ideas and start to turn them into stories and start to think about your characters? Yeah, I think that uh, for me, my personal process and how I did it all comes from, from the characters first. Um, and what kind of a situation could I see Nico in where he would need to use this kind of strategy and sort of thinking of it in that sort of backwards way and working, working backwards um, rather than starting with the strategy, starting with what got the character to the point that they need it in the first place. Um, and luckily that summer I was working with kids every single day. Um, so I was uh, seeing a lot of uh, what kids do, how kids act, um, and was certainly incorporating that into uh, giving me ideas for the stories. Um, and so I would, I would try to take something that would put a kid in a situation that they would need to calm themselves. And our first script that we did was, was belly breathing. Um, and that first one, I was like, what is something that an elementary aged kid would find to be super frustrating and overwhelming that they would need to try this strategy and they would need to be able to calm themselves in the moment. Um, and the first thing I thought of was uh, the block tower that you work so hard on and then it falls over and it's so frustrating and you, you put so much of your effort and investment into it and it becomes more than just a block tower to these kids. Um, and that, that sort of set, set us off on uh, creating the, the stories and starting to build this world um, was really finding the kids and the characters and how they emotionally react to things that they can then use the strategies that, that Emily was, was uh, sending my way um, to, to help them in those situations. So how did you think about developing the characters and, and how did the cast of characters maybe evolve over time? So they certainly evolved. Um, I, they, it, it was quite the evolution actually, as you know. Um, so um, initially we were using a, a different set of characters um, that were characters that I've used in my own uh, puppetry content that I've created. Um, and there were a bunch of them that, that I was in, including in these, in these scripts, uh, in these stories. Um, and I was taking what I knew about those characters that I had been familiarizing myself with for years, some of them, um, particularly our, the, the character who was the initial protagonist in that original belly breathing concept video uh, as a character named Tyler, who I've worked with for I think I I probably built him like five six years before this project even started to be a thought um, so he is a character that I'm very familiar with so it was easy to incorporate him and under like know how he would react to a certain situation um, and so as I continued to write these stories um, where these characters were using different strategies and finding themselves in different situations, I was pulling from characters that I had already worked with. Um, and then when we made the, the decision to switch over to um, having original characters for this project, um, I went to, I made a spreadsheet of uh, every story, every strategy and which characters were in them. And then from that spreadsheet, I started to uh, pull different characteristics of this character is in a lot of these because he reacts in this certain type of way. And oh, these two characters are kind of alternating, but they both react to situations uh, in this other way. And what are the, the driving uh, emotional responses behind each of these characters? And so I sort of took those um, I, I think there were probably like six or seven characters 
um, in the original set of stories and boiled them down to what are the three most, um, what are the three elements that are emotionally driving these, this group of characters the most and boiling those three down to three characters that we then created for this series to be Nico, CJ and Mina. It's actually interesting because I don't think I realized that you had that many characters to begin. I want to see who got who got the axe, who was cut. Oh from yeah. Well, so I remember we had a lot of characters, right? And then we often get asked this question: Well, why did you end up with three? And honestly, the response back is: It's what we could afford. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> right? Like, what gives us enough diversity, um, yet keeps us within budget to to do this? So, oh yeah, we had a lot, and we had grownups too. Yeah, right? there was one. Honestly, actually, um, Mina got her name from the one character that I had created for a, a script that wasn't one of my uh, characters that I'd used before was uh, Tyler's mom, who I had named Mina. Um, and that's how our Mina got her name was from that from that original character. So that kind of brings up an interesting follow up question for everyone. Um, there there really aren't any adult or grown up characters in these in these stories. Why, why, how did that come about? Why, why was that decision made? Who wants to take it, Yaniv? I see, if, I feel like you have an answer. Oh, I was seeing if anybody else wanted to take I was it. I say Emily should answer this question. <laughs> sure. So I think there, you know, thinking from the psychology education, it's so great when kids can model for each other. I mean, then if you think about just even remember when you were nine, like, are you more likely to listen to your friend or to your uh, a grown up that's telling you what to do? I think there's, there's some of that. And, you know, when we're thinking about who is watching these videos, and of course, you know, we all enjoy watching them, right? They're lots of fun. Um, but the target audience is, is for kids. So to be able to watch kids showing each other, then, you know, gives them the encouragement to, oh, wow, like, if I see a friend struggling, I can show them something that can help. So there's kind of that, you know, that peer modeling and sharing of skills with one another, um, as opposed to, you know, continuing to reinforce, oh, something's only helpful if a grown up tells me to do it. Because we all have our own skills and things that help us to feel better when we're not feeling so great. Um, and so just showing that as an, and both how the puppets and kids can, and the skits can model to each other, but then also how kids in the classroom and at home and wherever they're watching this can also take that and use that as well. So I'm thinking that now is a great time to bring in Sarah Nolan. Uh, Sarah, <laughs> um, and everyone I think was involved in this process, but Sarah, we brought you in um, kind of after a lot of these stories were underway or, or you know, fairly um, thought out, but you really helped us to, to go through the process of taking these stories and turning them into scripts. Can you talk a little bit about kind of how you started that process when you first joined Feel Your Best Self? Yeah, I'd love to. Well, when I, when I came in, it was probably around January, and the first thing we really started talking about was the puppet build. Um, so once we kind of got that off and running, uh, all the puppets were built by John Cody, uh, who built them here uh, in Waltham, um, and uh, with the original designs by Yaniv, and then John took them and turned them into the, the puppet designs. Um, and I think the first thing I, I came into was just like so much work. I mean, it was amazing what you all had done. And so I will say like all of the scripts were like in a good place. Like all of the dialogue that you hear is, is mostly there. Like, and the flow of the stories that you and even the team had done was, was settled. I mean, what I saw my job coming into was kind of imagining the world that this took place in um, kind of, creating more of a structured formula. There were, after the first read through of the scripts, I remember hearing a little bit of the mom in Mina, right? And so identifying those uh, little hurdles of like, okay, Mina's a little too um, 
uh, too much of a teacher in a lot of the scenes. And so let's like braid that a little more throughout. Um, I also saw my job as like figuring out, okay, these are educational videos. What and how does that educational component come together or, or reveal itself? Um, and yeah, just kind of, and, and then like braiding at the end, really like rebraiding the characters throughout some of the scripts. Cause I think the first pass, and we were even switching characters at the end there, but that first pass, I remember Nico was in like 12 of them <laughs> or like he was in a majority of them, which, you know, he was kind of the protagonist. But I think as, as that transition from, oh, we have all these characters to now we have three, you know, let's, let's really help them help each other a little more. I re, uh, specifically, I remember uh, in Feel It Together, uh, we, I suggested switching that to Mina at the end. So Mina, cause she kind of came in as the like, as the hero nine-year-old with all the information. And so it was nice to have, to let her have a vulnerable uh, episode as well. Um, but I'll say, you know, I was really inspired by like the first pass or the first visual um, that I was given when I came into the project was Yaniv had done a, a video of the belly breathing. And so what I would like to share, I don't know if you guys can spotlight me because I think I'll be able to share this through my frame. Um, is the uh, just the original belly breathing video that I came in to see. I, I uh, took I took this and and ran with it. Um, and so I'm just gonna play a minute of it. Please let please let me know immediately if there's any sound problems. <laughs> uh. Belly breathing. Oh hi there. You're just in time. I've been building this block tower and I'm just about to put the last block on top. Oh, it's gonna look so cool. This is so exciting. And there. Oh no, after all my hard work, that's it. I'm never building a block tower again. I can't believe that. Tyler, what's wrong? I, I went to put the, the last block on my tower and, and then the whole thing fell over and, and, and now I, I don't have my block tower anymore and I never want to build a block tower again. Oh, it can be so frustrating when that happens. It's really hard when we work hard for something and then it falls apart, isn't it? Yeah. I just... Yay. Amazing. And that's Yaniv. <laughs> like split screening green screening like both characters right in your like uh in your apartment yep on the same green screen that this background is on right now <laughs> <laughs> doing all the editing and the animation and stuff yes a to Z. <laughs> yeah puppeteers are very controlling uh and so i um uh, I was really inspired by that, and uh, I will. Sh I'm. I'm just going to go ahead and show the first minute of our final belly breathing, just um, just kind of to show where we got. Okay, let's see if this works too. Belly breathing. just fall apart. Yeah. 
Excellent. So that was the, the beautiful work of uh, uh, Sedwan, uh, Sedwan Hooks and Staff Shear as uh, Nico and um, CJ. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about you know coming in and seeing this original belly breathing video. You know, and I knew, and I think I was, you know, you're given a frame like, okay, we've got puppets, we are going to film on green screen. I, as a love of practical uh, effects, <laughs> green screen is is my uh, not my favorite thing to do. So my challenge was to figure out, okay, how do we make this puppet show, and how how do we engage green screen in a way that builds a, a really full environment. Kids have been on screens for two years. How do we make things a little more practical, a little more worldly? And it, it took me into, well, let's build this world first. Let's talk about um, you know, what the inspirations are. So I think I went from you know, Yaniv's first pass, you know, things like Elmo's world, um, I'm going to go ahead and go to, I believe this will work. Ah, depending. So I didn't, I couldn't put together. So one of the things I did, uh, was really go for some green screen inspirations when it came to different shows. Let's see if I can make that bigger. So there's, of course, Elmo's World. Uh, and then there's a show that I've been working on uh, here in Boston called Cozy Corner. And so that puppet is Rory. And I've been the director of photography for that project and Max. And all of those backgrounds are very, um, dig those are, are digital uh, illustrations uh, done by John Lechner, an artist in um, the Boston area. So I just was pulling these inspirations and I came across a friend of mine. I, I talked to him about this and had a consult. My friend, Brian Papsiak across the street from me worked on a show called Sesame Beginnings, which was a straight to DVD series. And this is an all green screen world. So all the puppets were shot on green screen, but the world itself was actually photographed. It's kind of a dollhouse that was photographed. And so that really made me start to think about all the different styles that are out there. And I started thinking about practical backgrounds. And so in doing that, I actually pulled and did tests with little Rory from Cozy Corner. Thank you, Faye, for letting me use this, uh, <laughs> this footage that I had. And I started uh, putting Rory in all these different backgrounds to figure out what, uh, what we want our world to be. And one thing that I uh, really was drawn to were these, these kind of practical backgrounds that had uh, a paper, paper background, there is real shadow. Uh, and one thing about shooting this way and filming this way um, is this allowed us to figure out what the format of these screenplays were going to be. So in deciding that we wanted this kind of paper world or, or physical world, that meant that the um, anything that is the animated toolkit or how do we visualize these strategies would come as an animation in a separate style. Um, and so this is when I engaged my friend, um, Juan Santos. Um, this is kind of just like a, a, a proposal that we did and, and how it's shot and gave him some inspiration. And I was like, Juan, he's a digital illustrator. This is actually from a, this background is a project that he and I worked on together. I basically said, Juan, send me some art for a background, an ice cream shop. Um, and let's see if we can get it in this kind of drawn out style and then one, a version that has a little bit of color to it. Um, and this is kind of what the test we ended up doing was this miniature paper model test. Uh, and for that, I actually sent Juan a bit of a layout 
of what the Scoopies would look like. So drawing all this, what is, what is this ice cream shop? Uh, and then he sent me the art, which was just to be tested. Uh, and that's kind of what it looks out, looks like as a flat world. And then that became uh, some, a dollhouse that I put together and set up in my studio. So you can kind of see getting it printed out, putting the actual background. And so we were able to test, okay, what does it look like when little Rory, you take photographs and we see little Rory on a, um, on a physical, in a physical world with, even though it's paper, you're seeing the shadow, uh, you can cut around, there I am, <laughs> you can cut around. Uh, because one thing that I had to think about when reading the scripts is the puppets have to do stuff in order to engage the strategies, in order to, um, let's say, uh, you know, in turn the dial, Nico gets frustrated with putting a sweater on. Well, in order to get him picking and putting a, down a sweater, we have to have cuts. So uh, in order to cut around with a physical world like this, it allowed us to change angles. So we could basically have these three shot or three camera setups. Um, and we did a bunch of tests. And what this allowed us to do is say, okay, what is this world? Do we want it in black and white? Do we want it in full color? And then after deciding that we really loved the, um, the backgrounds as a practical world, that meant that when animation appears, this was a test we did, that when the animation or the toolkit appears, it really is separate from the practical world of the puppets. So you're really aligning this world, this aesthetic of, okay, we have, you know, the physical world of the, of the puppets and where they are and where they live. And then you've got these imaginations that come through and uh, are, are visualizing the strategies that they're learning. Um, and so that really helped us go to the next stage, which was to engage with Luminous, who did an example, you know, once we had decided, yes, this is our art style, we really want to have these practical backdrops um, that will be, you know, uh, drawn and illustrated by Juan, um, then let's have uh, let's have the animated toolkit part uh, be an animation in the style of Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And that, that was one thing we discovered is this, the hand-drawn aesthetic of like Elmo's World or Diary of a Wimpy Kid or Captain Underpants, you know, those were all inspiration for visualizing and making the toolkits fun and kind of, you know, um, I would say relatable in the drawing style. So this was kind of the drawing style that we were going for. I really like the paper around like squiggle vision, like the poor cutout is, is kind of, a, we got a little bit of that in the feel your best self stuff. Um, and so once we had this world built, then it was time to apply those rules to all of the scripts. So when I got in, all of the scripts were pretty, like all the dialogue is there, right? It was just about putting it into kind of like, when I did a pass of all the screen of all of the scripts, I basically put everything into a screenwriting format, adding scene headings, actions, and descriptions. And I just broke up the dialogue in a way that gives us just a little more information about where we were. Now that we knew how we were going to build this world, we could actually go into the scripts and say, okay, yes, Tyler is building a block tower. It's about to put the last block on top. Now we're able to say that in my, you know, in my past, I said, okay, this is now going to be in the living room. And uh, instead of Tyler, it's Mina, like putting our characters through there. Um, and just kind of formatting everything in a way that's, uh, that's, you know, shoot ready. And then I would say, 
One thing that I really enjoyed doing and going through these scripts was discovering um, things that, like little things that Yaniv wrote that became bigger, right? So in Turn the Dial, there's this one little line, there's this little line that Yaniv put in that said, Nico tries to put on his sweater, but can't quite fit into it. So that's a great scene, but how do we break it into a, a screenplay that can go on to storyboarding? And so to go from that to the action breakdown, um, woo, that was the storyboards. The action breakdown, which was here, was going to, Nico tries to put on a sweater, he gets it stuck over his head. Uh, and then we, we have this big, uh, scene that goes into uh, looks like you grew out of it and Mina you know Mina grabs the arms of the sweater that dangle down she and Nico pull back and forth in a tug of war with the too small sweater I say it looks she pulls like she pulls it's too small so we get this kind of bigger scene out of this one little seed that was written in the originals. And so that's kind of what I was thinking about. The other thing was to really uh, finesse the rules. Well, I'll tell you from, from this script, then I was able to do storyboards. So going, um, going into the storyboarding of everything, every single scene was storyboarded because, and it just had to be because we were working from, from one, camera um and so as i went through the scripts i really just had to think about what are the shots how are we cutting around the room um camera maps really helped out uh and every single moment every storyboard was like 17 pages <laughs> so going getting something laid up from script to production ready took a took a minute um and the other thing I wanted to share was float your boat is another good example of just, you know, in the original scripts, there's a, um, the title says in a dance class. So we actually went from that into a whole dance section at the beginning of float your boat. Um, which was really fun. So I think it was really great to just be able to take everything, um, to take everything and, and make it like grow in, into the visual world of Feel Your Best Self. Um, another thing I came in to do was really take the formula that was there and take pieces that were a little um, discombobulated and say, okay, in every episode, we're really gonna start the action up front. So things like adding in the dance sequence, um, making, you know, instead of the puppets narrating what they're about to do, it's more like, well, let's see it. Show me, don't tell me. And so, you know, let's jump into Nico just in the middle of building the block tower. He doesn't have to say he's building a, a block tower. Um, and then at the end though, having that wrap up. So that's one thing that I came in with was to say, Let's at the end of each episode do a nice wrap up of the of the whole um, of the whole piece, uh, and you know reiterate what these strategies are, how you do it, and it's also like a little nice moment to have the puppets look right into camera because we we didn't shoot it in a way uh, where we're you know spiking camera every time or, or cheating to camera or talking to talking to the audience. We kind of like took a lot of that out. Um, so yeah, I think it was like a really beautiful like process to go from, you know, just layering people and, and team members that came in to really like fill this out. And then once we had our second pass of the scripts after I was done with them, that's when we started doing readings. And I will say Heather Ash was, was monumental in that as well, because she was the uh, supervising producer. She's also a UConn alum uh, from the puppet program. She's an Emmy winning puppeteer. And uh, she came in and, you know, it, she has worked 
uh, with Puppets on Film for a long time. And, and she said one of the first things was she was like, get those scripts locked and do and read them out loud <laughs> in a group. And that process, while it was very uh, difficult and it took a long time, uh, it was so worth it because I think we really, that's when we started to hear things out loud and we've got the educational component and the fun component kind of, you know, getting to have a conversation, you know, and that was really nice being, being able to say in a meeting, you know, instead of like sending edits back and forth, we were able to like come together and be like, that doesn't sound like a kid or uh, that's too specific. You know, that, that no kid knows what a, a snickerdoodle is a really fancy cookie. We need them to be you know, accessible cookie. Or how about we just said, feel your best self 20 times. We just said, feel your best self 20 times. <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's talk about that process a little bit because that was really fun. I feel like that was my debut as an actor when, you know, <laughs> we each got to take roles and read through it. And that was really the first time I've ever been involved in that type of process. And it was a fascinating kind of experience. You know, when you, when you write it and you even just read it to yourself, it sounds great. And then when you actually kind of go into those characters and read it together, you start to want to tweak things. Either it doesn't sound very natural, it kind of sounds robotic. We had a lot of discussions about what kids really like to do. Um, but then, you know, I think for us and, and what I really appreciated working with Sandy and Emily and her team was that idea of making sure that the language and the ideas that we're introducing into the stories are accessible. So um, I guess kind of a question for, for the group would be, you know, what was that experience like reading through the stories and what did we, what do you think, you know, we had to pay attention to and what did we start to tweak as we went through that process? Emily, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of from the educational standpoint, what you were keeping an eye out for when we were reading? Yeah, I mean, I, I think something that we ended up talking about a lot, really in every script was, okay, is any kid going to be able to watch this and relate to it? Like, no matter, you know, where they currently live, who they currently live with, what type of school they're in, you know, we were like, okay, we want a kid to look at this and feel like they can relate to it. So I think we had a lot of conversations about does this setting, is this setting accessible or somewhere where any kid could, could see themselves? Um, is this living space somewhere that any kid in their mind's eye could make it their living room, right? Like, so I think those were a lot of the conversations we had, are the activities and we had back and forths and, you know, in meetings would, would text our educator friends being like, do kids like puzzles? Like, you know, I don't know if I could see any kid doing a puzzle. Then we get, yeah, no, they like puzzles and have some of those conversations about the things that, you know, we were going back and forth on and making sure that any kid could access and enjoy watching them. And can, if I can just add really quick, just going back, Emily was really, really our, our, our watchdog in turn to make sure that we didn't take the strategy and take it too far away from what the actual intent was. If I remember the whole conversation around bring a high five versus give a high five. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you remember that, right? Because we had started yeah. to shift to give a high five and you really stopped everybody and said, it's not just a high five. It's about bringing, why don't you tell the story, Emily? I mean, yeah, I well, this conversation. Right. Well, I mean, it's, it's the bring a high five is kind of that gratitude space, right? So it's not just, oh, we're going to high five anyone that we like what they're doing. It's like, you know, we can do something fun to show someone we appreciate them. So that was kind of the, and Sarah brought this up earlier of making sure it's like, would a kid actually say this type of thing? So we're like, you know, not every kid's going to be like, I appreciate you and re be really verbal about it. But can we do something like make up a fun dance or even, you know, not every kid wants to high five and touch other people e even. So it's just making that a more an accessible way to show that you appreciate someone else. So it's bigger than just, we're going to, we're going to teach people how to high five. There's the background of going back to the evidence of that gratitude practice to make sure that the strategy aligned with what we know works to make well, people feel better. And that helps with the modeling as well, because you can actually model what happens, like the social awkwardness of a friend that's like, I actually don't want to, like, I'm not comfortable with a high five. 
And like, I think having Nico in that second scene, like waiting for the, with his arm raised being like, uh, like, I think that kind of modeling is, is really nice because it shows it shows you how a child can like get through that situation. You know, oh, it happened to Nico. Like, oh, I just have to like flip to, oh, it's called bringing a high five. I don't have to actually do a high five. So that kind of thinking out loud is really helpful in all the strategies. Definitely. And I will say, because we just watched, uh, and this kind of gets at, I see the question in the chat there about, did we work with test groups of kids? Um, I think the short answer is we kind of are always consistently and, you know, as we've talked about, you know, we're even, you know, from Yaniv's point of working in a summer camp at the very initial, even thinking about what these were going to be and checking with kids, but we just um, had a teacher in a first grade classroom introduce bring a high five and almost no kids actually did just a regular high five, which you know, because they saw, oh, this is so cool. We can, a lot wanted to make up a dance or make up a special handshake. Like there were a bunch of other ways that they saw in the video that they're like, oh, this is a really cool way. Um, you know, and some were more about themselves. Some involved the puppets that they had made. So just really, again, even at first grade, getting that purpose of, okay, we want to do, the, the point is something fun to show that we appreciate somebody else. Now, Yaniv, I'm kind of curious, um, how did we kind of in those writer writing writer room situations look at the language and think about the stories and because I think I remember there being points where it was like does that sound too preachy or educational or like you know a, a after school video that's trying to teach you something um, so how did we kind of try to make it feel maybe a little bit more natural and fun yeah I think that that is the precise reason why I personally found those writer room meetings and read throughs to be so helpful um, was because it let us hear what was going on and then in real time together work to strike that balance that we were talking about earlier between curriculum and character. Um, and I feel like a lot of the time my job in those uh, writing, writer's room meetings was to sort of fight for the characters um, and make sure that uh, that they weren't getting to be too generic um, or like, I don't wanna say too relatable, um, but uh, in our, our effort to make sure that every kid could see themselves in any context, um, there were some times that uh, we lost a little bit of the characters. Um, uh, one particular thing that I remember was uh, in our conversations about um, how do we talk about who's at home, like who is living with these kids and these characters. Um, and from an educational standpoint, we were talking about using the word grown up um, because not every kid lives with their parents or not every kid lives with their siblings or, or whatever. Um, and we had talked about saying, oh, well, if, if the character would we're, we're talking about who they live with, they said, oh, well, my grown up tells me this, or I tell my grown up that I'm feeling this sort of way. And that was a, a, an example of a time that I had to jump in and say, oh, well, yes, we want it to be relatable for every kid who may or may not live with their parents, but also we need to make sure that these characters aren't any kid and that they are these specific characters. Um, and so I think that it was really great to to have those conversations together and work out how can we strike that balance and make specific characters that are also relatable to, to anyone who's watching. Um, and the, the resolution for that specific example was, we're gonna take these three characters and make sure that they have three different living situations in who they're living with. And so Nico, when he would refer to a grown up, he would refer to his dad who he lives with and Mina would refer to her aunt and CJ would refer to their grandmother. Um, and so in terms of uh, making it accessible, but also specific, I think that that was something really valuable that came out of that collaborative uh, space that we had in those in those writers meetings. Well, and I think you bring um, it to kind of uh, another question you kind of answered a little bit, but I want to talk about it a little bit more. I think what I was really impressed with what the team was able to do was create these kind of 
characters that were generic enough that could be accessible to kids in, in all different, you know, uh, parts of the country, different types of schools. Um, but then also give them enough personality that you feel like you can identify with them. And that's what I kind of love about these characters is there are like little parts of each of them that I connect with, you know, and, and, um, I guess, how did you, how did, how did we, but how Yaniv and I know Sarah thought about it too. How did we really create those personalities for those characters? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that it all, uh, sort of goes back to that, um, those initial characters that I sort of started pulling things from and, uh, taking a step back when we started the transition into the new characters and seeing what is this character primarily driven by? What drives this character and makes them the way that they are? Um, and sort of boiling those things down to then start building the characters back up from that base understanding of where they come from. Um, and I think that taking things like um, uh, anxiety and compassion and um, all those different elements that go into the characters that are things that we all experience, but sort of taking those things and blowing them up to become a full character. Um, and CJ is, uh, I think, the best example of this um, that they started from being a character that is primarily driven by anxiety. And that is sort of their go-to emotional response to when things don't go the way that they want them to. Um, and sort of taking that anxiety that so many of us experience at different points, but blowing that up so it becomes a fully fleshed out character. And then figuring out, okay, if, if that's their emotional response when things don't go right, what would that kind of person be like when things are going well or in their relaxation time or in other aspects of their life? What might they enjoy? Um, and using that foundational understanding of how we were gonna use that character to teach these strategies um, and then using that to sort of unlock the door to their, their full um, character understanding. Yeah, I think a lot of that like kid sounding dialogue was really done in those group, um, those, those, those group sessions, you know, reading stuff out loud. And even, you know, one, one thing I did in going through the scripts was just following the logic, right? I think that's one thing that I tried to keep up with, like uh, Yaniv was talking about like CJ's anxiety. Well, like following, well, what kind of anxiety? Like, especially in Scoopies, it's like, is the anxiety coming from the routine is messed up? Is the anxiety coming from the fact that like the, the salesperson is different? Like what, what is the mishap? And like really identifying like, and not going from zero to 60, but like, what is the step-by-step -step logic? And I think both visually and within the dialogue, moving some of the dialogue around so there is a heightening um, and, and like characters listening to itself but not repeating the same thing. That was, that was one thing that I was noticing in, this, in the scripts was like, there was a lot of like saying the same thing a couple of different ways, but it's like, what is the information we're adding each time um, in in this trajectory and especially visually just like because these strategies depend on sometimes the characters actually doing things like and when puppets have to do something new they need they need a cut they need uh to go somewhere to do it you know there was in float your boat just the idea that cj and nico have to be at a tabletop right? It's like, well, they're dancing first. So let's have them exit the scene, go to the other side of the room where there's a table and their backpacks, right? And let's like set these stages. Uh, so we have the tools we need to do the strategies. So I think that um, that kind of like film logic uh, was, was really helpful to kind of like be able to do a pass at that and then, and then come back together as a group uh, reading them out loud and, and just changing little things like, uh, 
even even having you know uh just shortening sentences to be to be not so not so descriptive or sometimes mina's language was a little adult so we'd par parse that down together uh i would say like heather ash was great at that when she would read a line it would just she'd just be like you know shorten it a lot so that i think really really helped so it helped it's helpful to have i thought it was an amazing chemistry that we all had you know and we all had our our missions <laughs> So as we get close to wrapping up, I'll just uh, put it out there that people can ask, you know, their final questions in the chat and we'll address those. Um, but uh, Emily, I wanted to kind of ask you, you and I have spent some time over the last few weeks um, getting to visit a school in Willimantic. And so what has it been like getting to see like these videos finally have their intended audience. You're getting to watch all these kids see these videos for the first time. What has been kind of the impact on you or your reaction to seeing that? It's been so cool because as you know, anyone who's listening has heard, we've been so in the nitty gritty and know every single detail about these things happen that it it's like, you know, I remember when the when the videos were being filmed and it's like getting to see the pieces come together, but then to get to relive it and watch it basically through the, for the first time through the eyes of the kids in the room is so cool because to hear them laugh at the right spots and to see them practice along with the, you know, whoever the character is that's learning the strategy is so, it just, it's really cool. I mean, it's, it's one of those, I, I leave every day saying my heart grew three sizes today because, you know, you get to see the, the kids, it just it really warms your heart to see them get to react to the different strategies and it's really also interesting to see which strategies the first graders resonate with more and which ones the third graders resonate with more and being so su pleasantly surprised at how much they like the strategy i'm like sometimes i feel like i'm like slipping these kids a five to tell me how much they love it but that's they're really i'm not <laughs> but they're really um really engaged and enjoying um, the, the characters and you know if if one kid for example forgets Nico's name you hear a kid in the back going that's Nico and they, they you know tell each other that so they're really it's just been so cool to see them connect with the characters and learn the strategies and hear about which strategies are their favorite that they you know when we talk about um, so yesterday we, we talked about okay let's say you're feeling heavy or maybe something happens at recess that you're unhappy about or you don't get picked for a game you know what's your favorite strategy and how can you use that and we heard, heard a lot of okay I'm going to ground it down or you know when I'm at recess I'm going to shake out the yuck to help me feel a little bit better if you know so and so doesn't want to play with me so it was just really really neat it's been I think really cool. you should uh, uh tell them what your nephew said to you the other day too so I was going to say I think uh, kudos to the team for sure in making an, and then tell your story about making these characters really relatable. I know I've heard from the Dean of the Neag School of Education, Dean Arizari tells me that his nephew thinks that Nico is, was made just for him. You know, it's like, like I hear those stories, but just the other day, Emily uh, had texted us like my nephews came home and we're like, you tell them. Oh yeah. Well, first of all, they ask to watch the puppet videos all the time, but well, First, the, you know, my nephew who's about to turn seven was six and a half when the first videos were coming out. And he was like, when it, there, he watched the one where Nico, you know, said he was six and a half. He's like, oh, what? Just like me. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I got to take a picture with the, with the puppets and the, the, you know, they go, how do you know them? And they were just like, thought it was the coolest thing. So now I'm the cool, I'm the cool aunt, which is really fun, <laughs> but they really love the strategies and, you know, the, the my seven-year-old nephew you know, went up to my sister and was like you know showed her how he could belly breathe after the video and at different times too so it's really been fun to hear that that's amazing it's, I think we should end it on uh and she's the cool aunt everyone yeah <laughs> <laughs> Well, if, if no one has any, I guess, final questions for each other, I'm curious if we um, can maybe give a quick, what's your favorite video? I know that's hard because I have like five, but I'm thinking that all of the viewers are going to go onto the Feel Your Best Self website and watch these videos. So which one should they go to? 
Does anyone have a favorite? Can I say two? Yes. Uh, my first that I'm going to say is um, Float Your Boat because of the dancing. It's just super that. fun. Um, and then my second favorite, or my other favorite that I'm going to mention um, is um, Chillax in My Head because the ice cream flavors were just so fun to write. And that that whole episode and, and CJ's inner monologue in that was very fun to write and then see it come out and fully uh, expressed by, by the character and through the, the video editing and animation is just, was really very fun. <laughs> Who wants to go next, Emily? I, I, I definitely agree with both you, Emily, that I have, I feel like they're all my favorite in their own way, but I think, um, I do also love Chillax in my head, but I think Shake Out the Yuck is just so fun. And I think it's so relatable for a kid or adult to have stage fright. And like, you know, I, uh, Sandy and I were talking to some, some educators the other day and we're, you know, we all kind of realize together, I think that we do sometimes, sometimes you'll just like do a little, you know, like shake it off for a second. And it's just the things that, you know, how we connect with that, that it's really something anyone can do quickly. I just, I, I think it's cute. And I like the, when, when CJ's like, shake out the, the what, what's yuck. It's just really cute. How about Sarah? This is a really hard question. <laughs> uh, I, I, it varies from day to day because sometimes I need techniques that, I mean, we, we, I think when we were working on this and going through production, we were constantly reminding each other to, okay, just turn the dial, just, just turn the dial for a minute. Um, but yeah, I, right now I would say feel it together just because there's a really nice puppet moment in that when Nico puts his hand on Nina's hand and, and the hug at the end, like I'm, I really love the affection in that. And, and, you know, and especially that idea of like a, a, a younger kid consoling an older kid, you know, it's very Montessori. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I feel like it's, 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 there's something really simple and really nice about that one. That's, that's really special. That is a really sweet one. Sandy? Or do you want me to go? Do you have one? I, mean, I think you should go. Okay. Um, I'll say two. I was going to say turn the dial has become a big favorite of mine personally, because I think it's important for us all to remember to just turn the dial and change your perspective sometime. And I think watching the kids in the first grade, when they saw the scene where they see the leaves change and they go, Ooh, ah, all the kids just laughed and imitated that. And it was so sweet. So that one's been in my mind. And then I just was watching Three Friendly Wishes in Spanish uh, as we were working on the video and the chalk art scene, amazing. Just amazing what you all pulled off. So say, that's my honorable mention is the, is the montage in Three Friendly Wishes. Yeah, so impressive. Looking okay. to open the chalk box. <laughs> I love it. And, and the kids know. said in one of the classes watched that yesterday and the kids were like, this music is cool when the, when the montage came on. So just wanted, thought that would, this is a good time to mention that. <laughs> they thought hey, it was Sandy, cool. Do you want to wrap us up? I don't have a favorite. And I really do mean that. I mean, I do say shake out the yuck a lot in general, because I think that's an initial draw, particularly for the really young kids, because it, it has an element of being silly and it's kind of the hook in on some things. Um, but you know, I don't know. I like uh, be a kind helper as well because I like the, the grocery bags and the vegetables and all that stuff. So I don't know. I, they're all they're all charming in their own unique ways. Well, luckily they're each five minutes, so you can watch all of them in a pretty quick amount of time. So um, Matt will drop in the chat the link to Fill Your Best Self, but it is just fillyourbestself.org. Um, you can watch all of the videos are available in English right now. Also, we should throw it out there that there's a very catchy uh, theme song that you can watch. And the videos are getting posted in Spanish as we speak. So uh, there's an, a good number that are up on the page. I think we're at majority now. I think, yeah, majority are up available in Spanish, along with a lot of the resources are available in both English and Spanish. And they're all free and available um, on our website. So you can go to the link in the chat. 
Now, I want to thank you all for joining us. This has been a really fun conversation in a walk down memory lane. Um, and uh, just so everyone knows, our backgrounds are actual art from the Feel Your Best Self project. And these Zoom backdrops will be um, available on the website soon, too. So you can you can use them in your own meetings. Um, but not thanks. Sarah's. Oh, <laughs> she not Sarah. Although Sarah, we should make that. Yeah, there we go. Sarah's the workspace. Studio. <laughs> there we go. There's scoopies. scoopies. <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us. Um, and I'm sure we will be having more Feel Your Best forums uh, as the project grows. Um, but again, join us next week at the Ballard Institute for Squirrel Stole My Underpants. And our last forum will be on uh, December 6th at 7 p.m. topics in Japanese puppetry. Just a reminder that all these programs are made free and available because of support um, by attendees and, and friends of the Ballard Institute like yourself. So if, uh, if you're interested, you can make a donation to support this programming and Matt will drop the link in the chat. But thank you all for joining us and we'll see you again soon. Bye. Bye.